I hate these kids. Now, not you. I'm just reading what's on this card here. I found this card in an old drawer with some old teacher stuff from the first school that I taught at when I became a teacher in New York City. It was a school in central Harlem. And uh, I meant to go into the inner city. I wanted to do something significant, but I hadn't signed on to end up in the most dangerous school in New York City. Out of the 1.1 million students, 1,500 schools, and the largest public school system the world has ever known, I ended up in the school that had the highest rate of student injuries per capita, which the fact that they tracked that metric tells you something about what some of these schools are like. The New York Post called it a hellhole where teachers should get combat pay. I've never been through anything like this in my life. I mean, I wasn't naive. I went to an inner city school myself. I remember knife fights. We had a couple of race riots that made, inter made national news. And I've tutored kids my whole life, and I, I was going in with my eyes open, but this was a very unique um, situation. I'd never been through this kind of pressure. I'd never had uh, kids throw things at me when I was trying to teach. Um, I've never had, been in a situation where students were openly trying to defy me and disrespect me. I've never been cursed at more in my life. Um, I never had anyone threaten to rape my wife before. It was just... Uh, a high pressure situation where I was pressed down, shaken up, and things came out that I didn't realize were in there. Now, before that, I had worked as a pastor at a church, and it was our home church, and my wife and I were like darlings at that church, and everybody loved us. And this thing happens when you're around a lot of really well intentioned Christian people who say sweet things to you all the time. You start to kind of think, like, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I'm one of the good people. But then life turns it up, the pressure comes, it shakes it up, and things come out that you didn't know were in there. I was so desperate at that school, just trying to keep my head above water, trying to make some kind of difference, trying to follow the Lord, that I started to write scripture verses on these little index cards and carry them around with me, just clinging to them like life preservers in the storm. And on this particular card, I wrote Hebrews 12:11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And in the mornings, I would splash water on my face and look at the zombies staring back at me in the, window, uh, the mirror and say, for righteousness and peace. Maybe it would be worth it for righteousness and peace. But at some point, in one of those hours of pressure, I scrawled on the back of this card, I hate these kids. What do you do with that? What do you do when you realize you have a dark side? What do you do when you fail? Honest people have this experience. People who are real have this experience. And every single follower of Jesus has this experience. No exceptions. Peter was definitely not an exception. He had an experience like this. It happened for him on the night when Jesus was arrested. It tells us about it in Luke chapter 22. Then seizing him, Jesus, the soldiers, they come and they seize Jesus. They arrest him. They led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. So they've come to arrest Jesus, and they lead him off into the dark. They take him to the high priest's house, which is a big villa, a big mansion, and there's a courtyard outside, walled courtyard. And all of the servants of the house, it's the middle of the night. They've gathered in the courtyard. It's cold, so they kindle a little campfire. And Peter is following along at a distance, probably um, to see what happened, probably to look for an opportunity to help Jesus to break him free, maybe to look for a chance to throw in some evidence to help him be acquitted and found innocent, but he wants to help. He's following along. He slips in among the people, and the servants are gathered around the campfire, so he just kind of slips in and pretends like he's one of the servants. This is a dangerous situation. He is in enemy-occupied territory. They have, they have arrested his leader, Jesus. They're planning on trying him and executing him, and Peter is on the low among the servants trying not to get found out, and then in verse 56, a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him. Imagine how creepy that must have felt to Peter. And said, 
this man was with him. You ever been caught in a lie? Like, you ever been lying to somebody and you could tell that they knew you were lying? This one time, I tried to sound, sound smarter than I am, and I was quoting this old movie. It's, this is going to date me, but it's a really cool movie called Amadeus. It's about the life of Mozart. It has these really quotable lines in it. And I was trying to sound smarter than I am. I was quoting a line from that movie to my friend and pretending like it was an original thought from me. And so I said this line to him, and my friend was like, yeah, dude, I've seen Amadeus too. And it was like, uh. You know when that happens? You know, you're lying to somebody, and you can tell, they can tell that you're lying. You've got two choices. You can kind of admit it, or you can do what almost everybody does. You, like, double down. You double down. Don't come into the light. Double down. And that's exactly what Peter does. He denies it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. He's in full-out defensive mode now. You know, you come to something like CIY or youth group or you have a conversation with a mature Christian friend, and it's really easy to think how true to Jesus you're going to be. You know, Jesus is in the right part in my life. He's the priority. He's the main thing. He's everything. He's saved me. And, but then you, you get back into your context. You get back on your block or your neighborhood or around your friends or your cousins or the people at school or whatever, and you're the only one there, and it's easy to let it kind of tone down a little bit. You let your language get a little rough you downplay it a little bit. He's not that big a deal to you. We, we can all understand how this happened to Peter. And he's in da- physically dangerous situation here. So he's in full-out defensive mode. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Now, Jesus came from a small town called Galilee. They probably had a unique accent from that small town, which Peter shared. He could tell that Peter was from the same small town. He's like, they're from the same town. Surely he's with him. Peter replies, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And then it happens. Verse 60, just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Flashback, earlier that night when they were sharing their last meal together, at one point, Jesus pulls Peter aside for a little heart-to-heart, and he says to him, Simon, Simon, that's interesting, not Peter, not the rock, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan, the accuser, the adversary, the enemy of God and of God's people, Satan has asked to sift you to turn up the pressure, to press you down, to shake you up and see what's really inside there. But I, Jesus says, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And Peter's thinking, when I've turned back, Lord, I'm with you. There's no turning away from you. And he replies, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Fast forward to that night. They've arrested Jesus. They've taken him away. Peter follows him at a distance. He slips in among the servants. A servant girl says to him, you were with him. Peter says, no. A man says to him, aren't you one of them? He says, man, I am not. About an hour later, another one says, you've got to be from him. You're from the same hometown. And Jesus says, I don't know the man. And right at that moment, verse 60, just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This one time when I was a really little boy, there was this other boy who was talking bad about his mom. He was really complaining about how awful she was. And I wanted to be a part of the conversation, so I contributed. I said something bad about my mom, and instantly I had this sinking feeling in my stomach. My mom was a really good mom, and I just had this sinking feeling in my stomach that that was not a right thing to do. And here I am, a grown man, and I can still remember that moment clear as day. Or I can go back even further. One time in kindergarten, I went to the back of the room during like playtime or something, and I saw this little roll of quarters taped up on the back shelf. Probably some other kids' milk money or lunch money. Less than two bucks of quarters taped up the back shelf. And I took it. 
Now, you can look in from the outside, and you can be like, ah, whatever, you were five years old, you didn't really know any better, it's really not that much money, everybody does that. No, no. I knew. I knew. I didn't need anyone else to tell me it was wrong. There was a law written on my own heart. I knew it the second I did it. I knew it was wrong, and you know what? I did it anyway. Also in kindergarten, I had the like really dinky pack of crayons, the little 12 pack of crayons, and there was this kid that had like the Cadillac box of crayons, the 128, you know what I'm talking about, with like key lime through fuchsia and everything in between or whatever. And uh, I was jealous of this kid. I wanted that pack of crayons. But I knew what my mom would say if I asked her straight up. We didn't have money. So if I asked her straight up, she was going to say, sweetheart, we can't get that. We don't have money for that. So I made up a lie. I went home and I told her that the kids at school were making fun of me because of how dinky my pack of crayons was. And you know what? She bought it. And then she went and bought the crayons. And I never could enjoy them. You have a memory like that? You know, somebody else would try to blow it off and be like, it's no big deal, but you know, you know. When you think back on it, you almost physically cringe to think about it. What do you do with that? What do you do with the secrets? If you're going to come to the real Jesus, real things come out, what do you do with it? Well, I can tell you what most people do with it. Most people stuff it, deny it, push it off to the side. It's too threatening. It's too painful. Because we think, we really do think, I really do think deep down that if I'm not a good person, then... I won't be important. I won't be considered valuable. I'm not lovable. I can't be accepted. I won't belong. People will think bad things about me. I can't have a purpose. I won't have value. This we really think, and it's way too painful. It threatens way too much, so we stuff it. And here's how we stuff it. We say, well, of course, yes, I've done some bad things. I think some bad thoughts, but, I mean, I do a lot of good things too, right? And the good things outbalance the bad things. And if that doesn't work, we do this. Yes, I did some, I've done some bad things. I don't really like to think about that thing because it's kind of still, I can feel it, that it wasn't right. But look at him. I don't do the kind of things that he does. Or look at her. I don't do the kind of things that she does. Or look at them. At least I'm not like those people, and this is how we stuff it. And this keeps a lot of people from Jesus. It is keeping some of you from Jesus right now. Because in Jesus, you come to the one man in history, the one man in history, that no matter how life turned it up, no matter how the pressure pushed down, no matter how he got shook up, no matter the pain, no matter the shame, no matter the embarrassment, he always stayed true through and through. He always stayed pure through and through. And he sees right through me. Just like when that rooster crowed and he looked right at Peter, he's looking right at me, and he's looking right at you. And I come to him and I say, Jesus, this, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. And he says, I hear you, Chris. Um, that's who you want to be. That's who you think of yourself as. And that's who I want you to be. But you need to know that the enemy is coming. He's going to turn it up. He's going to put the pressure down. He's going to shake you up. He wants to see what's really in there. And I know you guys are young, but I think most of you have already figured out that this is exactly what life is going to do. It's going to turn it up. It's going to put the pressure down. It's going to shake you up until what's really in there comes out. And the question is, when those moments happen, what do you do? Well, that's when you need to know. Jesus says, the enemy is coming. But I have prayed for you. I mean, this keeps a lot of people from Jesus because they, Jesus, you can't come to the truth unless you're willing to let the truth come out. But that's really a tragedy because Jesus says, it's the devil that wants to shake you up. It's the devil that wants to sift you and test you. But me, I, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And maybe you don't come from a home where you had Christian parents who prayed for you. Don't worry about that anymore because Jesus is praying for you. What an incredible thought that is. Jesus is praying for you. Following Jesus is as real as it gets. A lot of people try to fake it. There's whole churches dedicated to the project of faking it. But if you want to follow the real Jesus, 
It's got to be real. So what do you do with the failure? What do you do with the secrets? Could you bring it to him? My older son, Rowan, I've got two sons, a three-year-old and a two-year-old. My older son, Rowan, has not yet figured out how to lie. I don't know why, and I'm not complaining, but he just hasn't figured it out yet. It's inevitable, like we all do. He will figure it out at some point, but he just hasn't made the connection yet that he can make up a story, an imaginary story, and then try to tell it like it really happened and convince people that it's true. He hasn't figured that out yet. So what that means is when he does something bad, which he occasionally does, he's a really good kid, um, but, you know, he writes on the walls or hits his brother or whatever. When he does something bad, he just comes and tells me. Even though he knows there's probably going to be a consequence, even though he knows there might even be a timeout, which he hates, he still just comes and tells me. So I'll be, you know, whatever, doing the dishes or whatever, and I hear his little brother Leo start screaming in the other room, and within half a minute, Rowan comes running into the room, and he says, Dada, I don't want Leo to play with Lightning McQueen, so I hit him. (laughs) Even though he knows that there's going to be a consequence. He just comes to me and tells me. And you know what that does? I get to take him by the hand, and I bring him over to his little brother, and I'm like, Rowan, you got to kiss his boo-boo. you got to make it right. Brothers hug right now. There might be some kind of consequence. Balance is restored to the universe. Everybody is happy again, and we can all move forward. If only we could be more like my son. If only I could be more like my son. But we're all hiding. We've been hiding from the beginning. The first two of us, Adam and Eve, in paradise, they broke the only rule God gave them. And then when God came looking for them in the garden, they did something that humans had never before done in history. They hid. And we've been hiding ever since. But Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a little child. So I'd like to challenge you today to be brave, to be real. Could you bring some stuff out into the open? Could you have the courage to open up a little bit with each other if you can? But if you're not ready for that, would you at least open up to him? Do you want to see the real Jesus? Well, if you want to see the real Jesus, then you have to be the real you. Father, I pray that some word that was heard was yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.